Wow, this is the most sold out we've ever, ever had this event. So I want to start with thanking four people or four groups of people. Number one, I want to thank everyone in this room because if you're in the internet industry, you normally don't start work till about 10.30 a.m. So everyone that's here, big, big round of applause because you're here early. <clears throat> people always ask, why do we do this? Why do we do this event? And I thought I'd just share two things. Like, we don't, we don't do this to make money. We're not an event company. One of, the main reason we do this is we want the internet economy to grow. We want it to get bigger and bigger. And when we first started this event, it was very hard for investors to believe in Southeast Asia. And number two, there was probably no companies worth over 200 million US dollars. Now when you fast forward five years, lots of investors love Southeast Asia. And there's lots of big, big companies and lots of those speakers are here today. So when we think about why do we do this event, it's, it's two things, two things that we believe that we're really, really passionate about. Number one is that we're really, really passionate about disruption. We're really passionate when a small group of people with limited money, limited insights, a small little office at a cool co-working space like Common Ground or something like that, and they want to build something big and amazing and take on the world, that's something that we're really passionate to find a way to support them. And an event like this helps you get support, helps you get connected, helps you get knowledge. Number two, the other thing that we're really, really passionate about is Malaysia. Really, really passionate about this country. And <clears throat> thank you. Woo. You know, many people say, why don't you do this in Singapore, where it's, which is more a finance capital? And you know what? This, is, this event is not about Singapore. This event is... You know, we have this crazy vision that why can't Klang Valley be the Silicon Valley of Southeast Asia? And that's why we do this event in Malaysia every year with all of us here, because that's what we believe, and that's what I think would be a great thing to happen in the next five to 10 years. <laughs> Thirdly, the third person we want to thank is we want to thank the environment, because Honestly, we've probably all collectively been treating the environment like crap, yet the environment is still there for us, still keeping us alive, and one of the things that we're going to do going forward and working closely with a good friend is making Wild Digital one of the first tech events in the world to really have a pro-green and pro-environment theme, so really big thanks to everyone for supporting the environment going forward. Number four, lastly, I want to thank the team. If there are six amazing women who run Wild Digital, and they haven't slept probably in a week, and, but they're masking it really well. So if you see anyone wearing a, a Bole t-shirt or a Wild Digital t-shirt, give them a hug, give them a kiss, give them Red Bull, give them coffee, because they've done an amazing job. So can I have a big round of applause for the girls from Wild Digital? They're just <laughs> killing it. So I thought I'd share the five Ps of entrepreneurship, and I'm going to do a quick survey. How many of you went to Wild Digital four years ago? Okay, I'm going to admit, this is the exact same presentation I gave four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is that as I was reading through it over the weekend, I realized that everything that we presented is still equally relevant. So I'm actually going to present it again, and <clears throat> but with a little bit of a more modern twist. So one of the things that I've always found fascinating is when you look at Malaysia, this is, you know, this is KLCC, something like 40, 50 years ago, and if you think about this country, Malaysia is a startup. Malaysia is no different. It, you know, it had some resources, didn't, it had some founders, had a management team, needed funding, needed a big crazy idea, you know, what are we going to build, what are we going to specialize in? And when you think about what Malaysia has achieved over the last 50 years, you know, you've got this beautiful country that's gone from being a third world country to now almost being a first world country. And if you look at what's happened in the last 50 years, you know, Malaysia, in a way, is like a unicorn. It has become a great, thriving economy that sustains almost everyone in this room. So when you start to think about, you know, what are the things that create great companies, there's a statistic from Silicon Valley which always fascinates me, and that 10,000 companies are funded every year. Yet, only 15 of those 10,000 companies take 85% of all the value created. So when you think about that, you're almost saying the 9,850 companies are 
actually not creating that much value. It really all goes to 15 companies that take the lion's share of value. So when you think about it, the question isn't, hey, should I start a startup? The question is, how do I become one of those 15 companies? What, you know, what is the secret to success? And what are the things that are important to make sure that the company that I'm involved in has the greatest chance to be one of those 15? <clears throat> when you think about unicorns being built, there's now been 362 recognized unicorns. So that is a private internet company worth over a billion US dollars. Of those 362 companies, the typical company took 6.2 years or 6.5 years to be a unicorn. So you think about that, that's incredible. You're creating a billion dollars of value in six years. And what's more fascinating is that those companies have raised on average 273 billion, but created 1.1 trillion in value. So there's almost a 4x return in all of these companies that have been funded and created. So when I think about what creates these big companies and you know, what is what, what are some of the softer factors that are important in studying which are the big 15 that take 85% of the value? Number one is when you think about it is you need to start by tackling a really, really, really big problem. It sounds obvious, but a lot of the internet companies today don't really, they just think, oh, I want to build an app for blah, 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 because I think it's cool. But they don't really think, are you, what big problem are you actually trying to solve? Because when you look at most successful internet companies, most companies are not doing something new that's never been done before. This is an important point. Most big successful internet companies are actually doing something that you have already done before, but they do it better, cheaper, and faster. So that's the key thing. So you've got to identify something that has a lot of friction, is expensive, is annoying, it's hard to do. So if you look at ride hailing, it's pretty much mind blowing that 85% of taxi hailing is now done through an app. Whereas you go back five years ago, 85% of taxi hailing was done using your hand, just walking down the road and stick your hand. Nobody does this anymore. Nobody uses their hand. They just use the app and they look down at the app. They don't even look at their cars coming and wait for their car to come. So when you think about what happened is that all these great ride hailing companies, Grab, Gojek, DD, Uber, they actually didn't invent something new. You already wanted to catch a car. You already wanted someone to pick you up from the airport. The demand was already there, but they just made it better, cheaper, faster. <clears throat> if you think about a company that we were very fortunate to be involved in, a company called iProperty, the company today is about 14, 15 years old, and I'm pretty sure today 90% of the people in the room, if you need a place to buy, sell, or rent, you will go to the internet to do this. Whereas you go back 10 years ago, most people use the newspaper. I don't know if you remember 10 years ago, if you, if you on a Monday wanted to find a place to live, you would have to wait for Saturday's newspaper. And then you wait six days, you get Saturday's newspaper, there's no photos, there's phone numbers, and the agents sometimes don't want to tell you any details until you agree to meet them. So it was a very, there was a huge problem. It, it was a very inefficient and disorganized problem. Whereas the internet was able to say, you know what, let's do this better, cheaper, and faster. So something like iProperty, which ended up creating 2.5 billion ringgit worth of value, didn't invent anything new. It just took a problem that already existed in the non-digital world and made it better, cheaper, and faster. <clears throat> There's lots of great lists on the internet where you can study every unicorn created, and I guarantee if you look at every company, the problem is not to create something new. You're not, you don't have to create new demand. Demand's already there. You just gotta do it better, cheaper, and faster. Number two is passion. And I think when you look at these two gentlemen, you know, these are some of the greatest entrepreneurs that have lived in the last several decades. And the number one word that comes to mind when you think of these gentlemen is their passion. And what's very interesting is that if you speak to any of them about their business plan, they actually don't know any of the details of any of the business plans for their companies. But they very, very clearly know what they're trying to build and the problem that they're trying to solve. And the funny thing is, if you get the chance to speak to some of the VCs in the room today and think, what would you rather back? Would you rather back a great business plan or would you rather back a not so great business plan but an incredibly passionate entrepreneur? I guarantee you the more successful VCs will choose passion over business plan. So I think where this gets really relevant is that I very often meet a lot of young entrepreneurs say, hey Patrick, can you please look at my deck? Can you look at my business plan? And the funny thing is that 
You actually shouldn't be asking me to give you feedback on your business plan. You should be asking me to give you feedback on your passion for the problem that you're trying to solve because that's going to get you further than having the world's best business plan or deck. The funny thing is you can actually go online and see some of the decks for some of the great big unicorns in the US. And I guarantee if you look at those decks, you'll walk away a little bit disappointed because you'll be like, what? That was the deck that raised a billion dollars? That deck was nothing impressive at all. <clears throat> so I think the general rule to determine and this applies to almost every disruptive startup, is if you're passionate about what you're doing, then you're waking up every day saying, I would rather work seven days a week for nothing with people that I love on something that I'm really, really passionate for. And it's the people at the top who end up disrupting the people at the bottom who work five days a week for a lot of money with people that they really don't care about for a problem or a passion that they really don't care about. And time and time again, it's the guys at the top who end up beating and disrupting the guys at the bottom. Number three, people. <clears throat> so this is, this is a pretty funny photo, and this photo is available on the Alibaba.com website if you look at founders. This is the founding 17 members of Alibaba. It actually looks like Jack Ma and a bunch of cute girls, but it's not. It's actually... <laughs> It's actually Jack Ma and the 16 other people who agreed to work seven days a week for very little money for something that they were very, very passionate about. And, they were, and a lot of them came from industrial or factory back and, and backgrounds, and they were very, very passionate about helping Chinese manufacturers connect with the world. And these 17 individuals lived together for about six to nine months. And you know what? They ended up creating one of the biggest companies in the world because this is what they thought about every day. <clears throat> Here's some interesting stats uh, that studies out there have shown. An A team with a B grade business plan will consistently outperform <clears throat> a B team with the world's best business plan. Time and time again, this is shown to be true. Number two, co-founders perform better than sole founders. So if you're a sole founder, my advice would be quickly find uh, a co-founder, and there's no limit, you can have two, three, four, it doesn't matter, but I think what it's saying is that disruptive ideas, you know, it's building a disruptive business, it's hard work. It's seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and you know what, it's always going to be better if you do it with other people as opposed to trying to do it yourself. And here's the thing, if you think about all the great internet companies, there's always more than one founder. There might be one person that you read about in the newspaper, but you look behind the scenes, there's always a few other people who are equally important. Number three, and this is why we do events like Wild Digital, and this is why we have two after parties this year, is that 90% of game-changing ideas don't happen at a desk from 9 to 5 p.m. Game-changing ideas usually come at a conference, or when you travel, when you're on holiday, when you're asleep, when you're in the shower, or when you're in an after party having a drink, and you say, hey, what if, you know what, it was really hard to order this drink, it took 50 minutes for my drink to come. Wouldn't it be great if there was an app that could do it better, cheaper, faster, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Fourth, pivot. I used to say that CEO means chief everything officer. When you're the CEO of a startup, you do everything. Finance, HR, fundraising, look for the office, connect it to the internet, blah, 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 blah. Whereas I think what you're finding more as you study the great big companies that made it is that the CEO is really the chief pivot officer. Your, your number of roles is to say, everything that we do might be completely changed tomorrow. Everything. So CEO is really the chief pivot officer because it's your job to experiment, it's your job to test, it's your job to try again, it's your job to take a chance, it's your job to actually step outside your comfort zone and do things differently from everything else. How many of you use Gmail? All right, pretty much most of the room and pretty much most of the world, for about three years after it launched, and then Gmail got to about 300 million users, Within Google, it was still considered a beta test product. Can you imagine you have 300, people, 300 million people using it every day, and their whole life is being planned through a product that you consider a beta? And this is this whole point about they, they threw it out there and said, you know what, we don't know if it's going to work, we don't know if you like the features, but we're just going to throw it out there and see what happens. And guess what? Gmail itself is a multi, multi, multi billion dollar company if they spun it out. Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn, and one of the most prolific VCs in the Valley has actually said, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. 
And it's a question I get so many times around. It's like, what do you think of my app? I'm thinking of perfecting this. We're not ready to launch. But I was like, just freaking launch it. It doesn't matter. Get the feedback from the users. The users are the best people in the world to test and give you the feedback. Because <clears throat> if it doesn't work, you can just pivot it. You can just change it. And I'm sure all of you who use Facebook or Google or Instagram, I'm sure sometimes you notice there's little changes. Oh, how come the button was over here? Or how come the color was here? Because you are being A-B tested every day whether or not you realize it because everyone realizes that nothing is ever perfect and you need to assume that you're going to keep pivoting and pivoting until you make it better and better. <clears throat> if you look at Apple, probably the second biggest company in the world today, Apple's core product was at the top there. The desktop PC is something like 3 to 4% of Apple's revenue and Apple's profit today. So if the company did not dramatically pivot and change, like they would bet the entire company on new product launches, if they didn't do that, they wouldn't be a $800 billion company, they'd be a $100 million company. But Steve Jobs said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna keep launching, we're gonna launch an iPad, an iPhone, an iPod, et cetera, et cetera. So today, the iPhone is something like 50 to 60% of Apple's revenue and Apple's profit. Because very early on, Steve Jobs said, we must keep pivoting. We must launch a new game-changing product every 18 months. Because if we don't, someone else will. <clears throat> this is more a reminder of myself. And, and what I found interesting is that, I mean, Catcher has now been around for something like 20 years. Like, a long, like we're super old in the internet scene. And, but it took us eight years to finally find a product that worked and that could be funded and that could be backed and that could be floated, and that was iProperty. And iProperty was something that we launched in year eight of our journey as internet entrepreneurs. I'm not even going to talk about what we launched in years one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, because they didn't work, they didn't last, and they didn't get anywhere. But the point is, that because we kept pivoting and kept launching, we eventually found one thing that went from being zero to a $2.5 billion company. Whereas if we just kept focusing on idea one, or idea two, or idea three, it would be in, be in a completely different scenario. And then lastly is perseverance. This is probably the most important point of all of the five Ps. <clears throat> and Steve Jobs says it well. He goes, I'm convinced that what separates the successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful is pure perseverance. You remember the point at the beginning saying 15 companies take 85% of the value. How do you become those 15 companies? Well if, well, if Steve Jobs was here, he would say it's, it's the entrepreneurs and the teams that back them that have the most perseverance. <clears throat> Next time you go to KFC, you should look at the logo and you should ask yourself, if I was to build the world's biggest, coolest chicken fast food restaurant, why would I use as my logo an illustration of an old man with white hair? Here's the funny thing is, Colonel Sanders invented his special chicken recipe when he was in his 30s. It was finally in his late 60s that he finally found someone to invest in the idea and build KFC. So that's why when you see the logo, that's, how, that's what he looked like when he was finally financed and backed by investors. And he's kind of, he had about a thousand nine no's before someone said, you know what, I'm gonna fund this crazy old man because his chicken is really, really good. And guess what? It's now the biggest chicken restaurant in the world. <clears throat> When I look back at iProperty, you know, we, we probably had about 74 no's before we finally said someone and said, yes, I will back your business. When I look at iFlix, which is, a, which is a live company that we're still involved today, I literally counted over the weekend, we've had 289 no's in the last four years. If the company's raised over 300 million US dollars. So it just shows that just, you just gotta keep going and going and going. So I think if I can summarize everything into one last slide, it's Find a really big, beautiful problem. There's problems everywhere. Everywhere you look, there are problems. Find one that you're very, very passionate about. Don't find a problem that you don't care about, because, it, because there'll be someone else in the world who's very passionate about that problem. So find a big problem that you personally are very passionate to solve. Put together an amazing team to solve that together, because you're never going to solve it by yourself. And you know what? It's probably not going to work the first time, or the second time, or the third time, or the 99th time. And just accept from day one, just throw it out there and keep pivoting and pivoting until something works. And if that doesn't work, just have the perseverance 
to keep trying and trying again until it finally works. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a beautiful, beautiful conference. Thank <laughs> you.